Chapter 10, The Great Shooting Party. As soon as the doctor had driven away from the filling station, I went into the office and got out the sign that said, Sorry, Closed. I hung it up on the pumps. Then I headed straight for the caravan. I was too tired to undress. I didn't even take off my shirt, my dirty old sneakers. I just flopped down on the bunk and went to sleep. The, the time was five minutes past eight in the morning. More than ten hours later, at 6.30 in the evening, I was woken up by the ambulance men bringing my father back from the hospital. They carried him into the caravan and laid him on the lower bunk. Hello, Dad, I said. Hello, Danny. How are you feeling? A bit woozy, he said, and he dozed off almost immediately. As the ambulance men drove away, Doc Spencer arrived and went into the caravan to take a look at the patient. He'll sleep until morning, until tomorrow morning, he said. Then he'll wake up feeling fine. I followed the doctor out to his car. I'm awfully glad he's home, I said. The doctor opened the car door, but he didn't get in. He looked at me very sternly and said, When did you last have something to eat, Danny? Something to eat? I said. Oh, well, I had er... Suddenly, I realized how long it had been. I hadn't eaten anything since I had supper with my father the night before. That was nearly 24 hours ago. Doc Spencer reached into the car and came out with something huge and round wrapped up in a greaseproof paper. My wife asked me to give this to give you this, he said. I think you'll like it. She's a terrific cook. He pushed the package towards me. Then he jumped into the car and drove quickly away. I stood there, clasping the big round thing tightly in my hands. I watched the doctor's car as it went down the road and disappeared round the curve. And after it had gone, I still stood there watching the empty road. After a while, I turned and walked back up the steps into the caravan with my precious parcel. I placed it in the center of the table, but I didn't unwrap it. My father lay on the bunk in a deep sleep. He was, he was wearing hospital pajamas. They had brown and blue stripes. I went over and gently pulled back the blanket to see what they had done to him. Hard white plaster covered the lower part of his leg and the whole of his foot except for the toes. There was a funny little iron thingy sticking out below his foot, presumably for him to walk on. I covered him up again and returned to the table. Very carefully, I now began to unwrap the greaseproof paper from around the doctor's pre present. And when I had finished, I saw before me the most enormous and beautiful pie in the world. It was covered all over top, sides, and bottom with a rich golden pastry. I took a knife from beside the sink and cut out a wedge. I started to eat it in my fingers, standing up. It was a cold meat pie. The meat was pink and tender with no fat or gristle in it, and there were hard-boiled eggs buried like treasures in several different places. The taste was absolutely fabulous. When I had finished the first slice, I cut another and ate that too. God bless Dr. Spencer, I thought, and God bless Mrs. Spencer as well. The next morning, a, a Monday, my father was up at six o'clock. I feel great, he said. He started ho hobbling round the caravan to test his leg. It hardly hurts at all, he cried. I can walk you to school. No, I said. No. I've never missed one yet, Danny. It's two miles each way, I said. Don't do it, Dad, please. So that day, I went to school alone, but he insisted on coming with me the next day. I couldn't stop him. He had put on a woolen sock over his plaster foot to keep his toes warm, and there was a hole in the underneath of the sock so that the big metal thing could poke through. He walked a bit stiff-legged, but he moved as fast as ever, and the metal thing went clink on the road each time he put it down. And so life at the filling station returned to normal, or anyway, nearly to normal. I say nearly because things were definitely not quite the same as they had been before. The difference lay in my father. A change had come over him. It wasn't a big change, but it was enough to make me certain that something was worrying him quite a lot. He would brood a good deal, 
and there would be silences between us, especially at supper time. Now and again, I would see him standing alone and very still out in front of the filling station, gazing up the road in the direction of Hazel's Wood. Many times I wanted to ask him what the trouble was, and had I done so, I'm sure he would have told me at once. In any event, I knew that sooner or later I would hear all about it. I hadn't long to wait. About ten days after his return from the hospital, the two of us were sitting on, out on the platform of the caravan watching the sun go down behind the big trees on the top of the hill across the valley. We had had our supper, but it wasn't my bedtime yet. The September evening was warm and beautiful and very still. You know what makes me so hopping mad, he said to me all of a sudden. I get up in the mornings feeling pretty good. Then about 9 o'clock every single day of the week, that huge silver Rolls Royce comes swishing past the filling station, and I see the great big bloated face of Mr. Victor Hazel behind the wheel. I always see it. I can't help it. And he passes by me. He always turns his head in my direction and looks at me. But it's the way he looks at me that is so infuriating. There is a sneer under his nose and a smug little smirk around his mouth. And although I only see him for a three seconds, it makes me madder than mackerel. What's more, I stay mad for the rest of the day. I don't blame you, I said. A silence fell between us. I waited to see what was coming next. I'll tell you something else. I'll tell you something interesting, he said at last. The shooting season for pheasants starts on Saturday. Did you know that? No, Dad, I didn't. It always starts on the 1st of October, he said, and every year Mr. Hazel celebrates the occasion by giving a grand opening day shooting party. I wonder what this had to do with my father being madder than a mackerel, but I knew for certain there would be a connection somewhere. It's a very famous event, Danny, that shooting party of Mr. Hazel's. Do lots of people come, I asked? Hundreds, he said. They come from miles around, dukes and lords, barons and baronets, wealthy businessmen, and all that, all the fancy folk in the country. They come with their guns and their dogs and their wives, and all day long the noise of shooting rolls across the valley. But they don't come because they like Mr. Hazel. Secretly they all despise him. They think he's a nasty piece of work. Then why do they come, Dad? Because it's the best pheasant shoot in the south of England. That's why they come. But to Mr. Hazel, it's the greatest day in the year, and he is willing to pay almost anything to make it a success. He spends a fortune on those pheasants. Each summer, he buys hundreds of young birds from the pheasant farm and puts them in the wood, where the keepers feed them and guard them and fatten them up, ready for the great day to arrive. Do you know, Danny, that the cost of rearing and keeping one single pheasant up to the time when it's ready to be shot is equal to the price of 100 loaves of bread? It's not true. I swear it, my father said. But to Mr. Hazel, it's worth every penny of it. And do you know why? It makes him feel important. For one day in the year, he becomes a big cheese in the little world. And even the Duke of So-and-So slaps him on the back and tries to remember his first name when he says goodbye. My father reached out a hand and scratched the hard plaster just below his left knee. It itches, he said. The skin itches underneath the plaster, so I scratch the plaster and pretend I'm scratching the skin. Does that help? No, he said. It doesn't help. But listen, Danny. Yes, Dad? I want to tell you something. He started scratching away again at the plaster on his leg. I waited for him to go on. I want to tell you what I would dearly love to do right now. Here it comes, I thought. Here comes something big and crazy. I could tell something big and crazy was coming simply from watching his face. It's a deadly secret, Danny. He paused and looked carefully all around him. And although there was probably not a living person within two miles of us at that moment, he now leaned close to me and lowered his voice to a soft whisper. I would like, he whispered, to find a way of poaching so many pheasants from Hazel's Wood that there wouldn't be any left for the big opening day shoot on October the 1st. Dad, I cried. No, shh, he said. Listen, 
If only I could find a way of knocking off a couple of hundred birds all in one go, then Mr. Hazel's party would be the biggest washout in history. Two hundred, I said? That's impossible. Just imagine, Danny, he went on. What a triumph. What a glorious victory that would be. All the dukes and lords and famous men would arrive in their big cars, and Mr. Hazel would strut about like a peacock welcoming them and saying things like, Plenty of birds out here for you this year, Lord Thistlewaite. And, ah, my dear Sir Godfrey, this is a great season for pheasants, a very great season indeed. And then out they would all go, out they would all go with their guns under their arms, and they would take up their positions surrounding the famous wood, and inside the wood, a whole army of hired beaters would start shouting and yelling and bashing away at the undergrowth to drive the pheasants out of the woods towards the waiting guns, and lo and behold, there wouldn't be a single pheasant to be found anywhere, and Mr. Victor Hazel's face would be redder than a boiled beetroot. Now, wouldn't that be the most fantastic, marvelous thing if we could pull it off, Danny? My father had gotten him, had got himself so worked up that he rose to his feet and hobbled down the caravan steps and started pacing back and forth in front of me. Wouldn't it, though, he shouted, wouldn't it be terrific? Yes, I said, but how, he cried, how could it be done? There's no way, Dad. It's hard enough getting just two birds up in those woods, let alone 200. I know that, my father said. It's the keepers that make it so difficult. How many are there, I asked? Keepers? Three. And they're always around. Do they stay right around through the night? No, not through the night, my father said. They go off home as soon as all the pheasants are safely up in the trees roosting. But nobody's ever discovered a way of poaching a roosting pheasant. Not even my own dad, who is the greatest expert in the world. It's about your bedtime, he added. Off you go. And I'll come in and tell you a story. Chapter 11, The Sleeping Beauty. Five minutes later, I was lying on my bunk in my pajamas. My father came in and lit the oil lamp hanging from the ceiling. It was getting dark earlier now. All right, he said. What sort of, what sort of story shall we have tonight? Dad, I said, wait a minute. What is it? Can I ask you something? I've just had a bit of an idea. Go on, he said. You know that bottle of sleeping pills Doc Spencer gave you when you came back from the hospital? I never use them. Don't like those things. Yes, but is there any reason why those wouldn't work on a pheasant? My father shook his head sadly from side to side. Wait, I said. It's no use, Danny. No pheasant in the world is going to swallow those lousy red capsules. Surely you know that. You're forgetting the raisins, Dad. The raisins? What's that got to do with it? Now listen, I said. Please listen. We take a raisin. We soak it till it swells. Then we make a tiny slit in one of one side of it with a razor blade. Then we hollow it out a little. Then we open up one of your red capsules and pour all the powder into the raisin. Then we get a needle and thread and very carefully we sew it up. We sew up the slit. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw my father's mouth slowly beginning to open. Now, I said, we have a nice clean looking raisin chalk full of sleeping pill powder, and that ought to be enough to put any pheasant to sleep. Don't you think so? My father was staring at me with a look of such wonder in his eyes, he might have been seeing a vision. Oh, my darling boy, he said softly. Oh, my sainted aunt. I do believe you got it. Yes, I do. I do. I do. He was suddenly so choked up with excitement that for a few seconds he couldn't say any more. He came and sat on the edge of my bunk and there he stayed, nodding his head very slowly up and down. You really think it would work? I asked him. Yes, he said quietly. It'll work all right. With this, with this method, we could prepare 200 raisins and all we'd have to do is scatter them around the feeding grounds at sunset and then walk away. Half an hour later, after it was dark and the keepers had all gone home, we could go back into the wood and the pheasants would be up in the trees by then, roosting. And the pills would, beginning, would be beginning to work. And the pheasants would be starting to feel groggy, then, then be wobbly. 
and trying to keep their balance, and soon every pheasant that had eaten one single raisin would topple over unconscious and fall to the ground. Why, they'd be dropping out of the trees like apples, and all we'd have to do is walk around and picking them up. Can I do it with you, Dad? And they'd never catch us either, my father said, not hearing me. We'd simply stroll through the woods, dropping a few raisins here and there as we went. And even if they were watching us, they wouldn't notice anything. Dad, I said, raising my voice, you will let me come with you. Danny, my love, he said, laying a hand on his knee and gazing at me with large eyes and bright, as bright as two stars. If this thing works, it will be revolutionized poaching. Yes, Dad, but can I come with you? Come with me, he said, floating out of his dream at last. But my dear boy, of course you can come with me. It's your idea. You must be there to see it happening. Now then, he cried, bouncing off of the bed. Where are those pills? The small bottle of red capsules was standing beside the sink. It had been there ever since my father returned from the hospital. He fetched it and unscrewed the top and poured the capsules onto, his, onto my blanket. Let's count them, he said. We counted them together. There were exactly 50. That's not enough, he said. We need 200 at least. Then he cried out, wait, hold it. There's no problem. He began, he began carefully putting the capsules back into the bottle. And as he did, so he said, all we've got to do, Danny, is divide the powder from one capsule among four raisins. In other words, quarter the dose. That way, we would have enough to fill 200 raisins. But would a quarter of one of those sleeping pills be strong enough to put a pheasant to sleep, I asked? Of course it would, my dear boy. Work it out for yourself. How much smaller is a pheasant than a man? Many, many times smaller. There you are then. If one pill is enough to put a fully grown man to sleep, you'll only need a tiny bit of that for a pheasant. What we're giving you will knock the old, what we're giving him will knock that old pheasant for a loop. He won't know what's hit him. But dad, 200 raisins aren't going to get you 200 pheasants. Why not? Because the greediest birds are surely going to gobble up about 10 raisins each. You've got a point there, my father said. You certainly have. But somehow, I don't think it will happen that way. Not if I'm very careful and spread them about over a wide area. Don't worry about it, Danny. I'm sure I can work it out. I'm sure I can work it. And you promise I can come with you? Absolutely, he said. And we shall call this method the Sleeping Beauty. It will be a landmark in the history of poaching. I sat very still in my, my bunk watching my father as he put each capsule back into the bottle. I could hardly believe what was happening, that we were really going to do it, that he and I alone were going to try to swipe practically the entire flock of Mr. Victor Hazel's prized pheasants. Just thinking about it sent little shivers of electricity running all over my skin. Exciting, isn't it? My father said. I don't dare, dare think about it, Dad. It makes me shiver all over. Me too, he said, but we must keep very calm from now on. We must make our plans very, very carefully. Today is Wednesday. The shooting party is next Saturday. Christ, I said. That's in three days' time. When do you and I go to the woods and do the job? The night before, my father said. On the, fr on the Friday. In that way, they won't discover that all the pheasants have disappeared until it's too late and the party has begun. Friday's the day after tomorrow. My goodness, Dad, we'll have to hurry if we're going to get 200 raisins ready before then. My father stood up and began pacing the floor of the caravan. Here's the plan of action, he said. Listen carefully. Tomorrow is Thursday. When I walk you to school, I shall go into Cooper's store in the village and buy two packs of seedless raisins. And in the evening, we will put the raisins in to soak for the night. But that'll only give us Friday to get, re to get ready 200 raisins, I said. Each one will have to be cut open and filled with powder and sewed up again. And it will be at, and I'll be at school all day. No, you won't, my father said. 
You will be suffering from a very nasty cold on Friday, and I shall be forced to carry you home from school. Hooray! I said. We will not open the filling station at all on Friday, he went on. Instead, we will shut ourselves in here and prepare the raisins. We'll easily get them done between us in one day, and that evening off, we'll go up the road towards the woods to do the job. Is that all clear? He was like a general announcing the plan of a battle to his staff. All clear, I said, and Danny. Not a whisper of this to any of your friends at school. Dad, you know I wouldn't. He kissed me goodnight and turned the oil lamp down low, but it was a long time before I went to sleep.